Wi-Fi went out. Back. All right. We'll see how we work here with um, hooked up through my phone. Um, welcome, everybody. This is the General Housing Military Affairs Committee. We are taking up S-237, uh, which is a bill that we received this week. Um, it is a zoning and uh, affordable housing bill. And we have several folks here that we invited as guests who um, uh, two folks who uh, have written to us in opposition to at least section two and perhaps more, uh, as well as folks who had support. Now, I, I, I'm just going to, as, and we have Jacob Hemrick back who will, who will uh, perhaps uh, operate as a zoning whisperer for us um, when we have questions about what the state policies are in these categories if we have questions um, and Ellen is here to go over and Ellen, I guess you'll go over some of the stuff. David was originally uh, invited to go over the sections that he had written. That's what we talked about. Yes. Uh, day before yesterday. Um, but David is double booked and is in commerce working on CRF material. So Ellen is going to, uh, I think Ellen, you should start off the day for us uh, just to go through the sections of the bill that we did not say, see, so I will, um, state once again uh this is just our second day with the bill while we've had information that's come over from the senate that i've shared with the committee uh as well as some of the uh emails that i've gotten both in support and opposition so we are vaguely familiar with the bill but we are still wrapping our heads around the nuances of this so for the folks for, for um, Karen and Chip in particular, I know that it, you you have been in opposition to the to sections of the bill, and um, I just want to uh, let you know that we're not as up to speed with elements of this bill um, as you may be. So just remember that as we move forward, we we are still learning about what this bill is about and what the what the elements of um, what we're talking about, why they're important to you and to, and to the communities who have, who have gotten in touch with us. And I think the same thing goes for, for um, Peter Tucker, who was here to speak in support of the bill, um, or at least elements of the bill. Um, just, just remember that we're still starting our work on this bill. Um, so there may be, if we stop you and ask you questions, um, it'll be because we're trying to catch up on the content. So with that, um, I'd like to start with Ellen. And Ellen, if you can um, post, if you want, um, the sections that we have to just go through, which, um, which I understand you didn't write. Um, but if you could just give us a quick nutshell about what we, um, what we're missing, like don't even spend that much time reading it. Just sort of, if you could just give us the, the 25 word version of each section and then David will join us when he's able. Sure. So, um, on that, then I did submit a summary document. Um, it is posted on your webpage for today. And so I did try to do a one sentence description of each section um, to help orient you guys with the issues. And so then I can, I can uh, use that to do the quick version of the sections that we haven't gone over yet. So yeah, if you could just do that verbally, that would be great. And then, and then anything deeper than that, we'll, we'll uh, wait for David. Great, so uh, David's sections start with section 17. Um, that's page 15 of the bill, but on page two of the summary document. So section 17 is an age specific housing study. So it charges the Department of Housing and Community Development and the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living with uh, conducting a study uh, and to provide recommendations on age specific, an age specific housing plan and policies to focus on older Vermonters. Uh, and that's due by January 15th, 2021. Uh, section 18 and 19, those are both related to short-term rentals. So uh, section 18 authorizes the Department of Housing and Community Development to adopt emergency rules to collect data on short-term rentals and to submit a report concerning that data 
in conjunction with housing needs, with a housing needs assessment, a compilation of laws regarding short-term uh, short rentals, and recommendations for statutory and munic municipal regulation of short-term rentals. Uh, section 19 it adds language to Title 24 to give municipalities the authority to regulate short-term rentals, provided that the ordinance or bylaws do not adversely impact the availability of long-term rental housing. Uh, Section 20 was taken out of the bill by the Senate. Uh, Section 21 directs the Department of Co Environmental Conservation to assist the town of Brattleboro and the Tri-Park Cooperative in uh, implementing Tri-Park's master plan, including loan forgiveness or restructuring to allow for improvements to infrastructure to improve similar assistance to other parks and to identify changes necessary to expand the state assistance from other from certain special funds. Uh, yeah, so this is this section is broadly titled mobile home park infrastructure. Uh, section 22. Uh, authorizes the treasurer to use funds available through the credit facility for local investments to provide financing for mobile home park infrastructure projects. And then section 23 is the Vermont Housing Incentive Program. So it creates this incentive program to provide matching grants to landlords to improve rental housing that is vacant, blighted, or otherwise does not comply with health and safety regulations. And yeah, so that's the that's the high level overview of those sections. Thank you. I think that's sufficient for today for those sections. So thank you. And so, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so you'll be here um, on this on these sections. And before, I don't have the um, agenda in front of me. Do we have a set order run of witnesses that you scheduled? I don't. I don't have. An, I don't have a double screen going here. Not a set order. We were going to start with David and then begin with uh, the three witnesses, uh, Chip, and Karen and Peter. But it, it in no particular order. There was, there was no reasoning to how I listed them. It was basically just as I invited them. Okay, so I think what I'll do is um, I will uh, we'll start with Chip um, and then go to Karen and then Peter. And before we start with Chip, I'd like to just um, again uh, introduce Jacob Hemrick um, from the department. Uh, as it became clear during our testimony on Tuesday, um, there's Jacob, there's going to be some finer details that um, that we're probably going to ask for, um, or we may need clarification on on how we how we, how the state interprets some of the statute that we're talking about. Um, one question that I have that I wanted to put to you, um, not for an answer today, but but perhaps if you can let us know how difficult it might be. It's, it, I wanted to know how many people or municipalities does this actually impact? In other words, there's 246 towns. Not all of them have water and sewer systems. Um, most, and you know, again, I'm gonna use Waterbury as an example. We have a downtown designation where we have water and sewer, but we also have a water line. That same water line goes out through Waterbury Town. Um, so we are impacted by this uh, in the areas. So I just would love to get an idea of what we're talking about, what kind of communities where there's an where there's not. I'm assuming that there where there's not an overlap between designated areas and water lines, um, 
because there's already zoning that exists that um, promotes density in those designated downtowns. And we talked about that this is for towns that may not be designated downtown or areas of where there's bylaws for multi-unit structures. Does that sound like an impossible request? No, that's that's not an impossible request. And in fact, over the summer, we've been working on that um, on the Vermont Planning Atlas, uh, where you can uh, pull up a drop down layer that shows the status of a, a municipal plan in their bylaws, whether they have zoning subdivision or units, as well as the uh, the the mapped um, water and wastewater areas that we're aware of. Um, part of that data is um, part of the one provision in the bill is to ask the municipalities map um, map their water and sewer lines, and uh, and I think that would get at um, a, a better, more reliable data set of where the water and sewer service areas are, and where the lines are, and and as and you may remember um, from the summary that the there were related Act 250 bill provisions that were pulled out. And one of them is a delegation of the water wastewater permits from the state to the municipality. So it seems reasonable that um, that they have a rough, uh, that we could, have, we could have an improved statewide data layer of uh, where the water and sewer lines are. Okay, because it strikes me, and, and Jacob, I don't know if you could turn up your microphone at all. You're, you're coming sure. across a little bit quietly. Um, because again, I'm I'm still learning about this bill, and you know, I was struck by just the I'm just trying to get an idea of who, what, and where we're talking about. This is this is the proposal is it seems like it's revolutionary and huge, but I don't know that it is. But I do know that there are areas that are going to be you know that I I can think of you know Waitsfield has a water system, but not a full municipal wastewater treatment, though they have a miniature one. Um, so does that mean, um, and they have bus service that's irregular, um, does that mean that they would, you know, how would they fall under this, I think is where I'm, I'm going with that. I just wanted to do that before we took testimony, before we forgot, before I forgot. Um, Representative Trino, a question before we start taking testimony? Um, I did have a question for Ellen um, uh, in in respect to uh, with respect to the um, um, uh, what are we calling them um, improvement projects for mobile home parks so or infrastructure improvements so uh, would that be um, creating a new or better uh, sewer system uh, or water system within the park although is that's what is that what is anticipated in some in those sections? That might be a question for David. That uh, might, be, might be. Yeah, let's hold off on that till. <laughs> Ellen's with us on that. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, no, David is. I mean, this is this obviously came from the Senate, but David has um, quite a bit of knowledge of the of the mobile home park okay. situation. Great. So, Thank you. all right. Well, welcome, Chip Sawyer. Welcome from St. Albans. Um, nice of you to make it with us today, and and I appreciate you reaching out earlier and letting us know your um, your concerns about about this bill um, and the uh, just uh, and just another quick proviso for witnesses today and for committee we have to be on the floor at two so we have a short we have a short day ahead of us and so um, with that I've taken enough time for myself um, please chip join us welcome thank you Yes, thanks. <clears throat> and thank you, Representative Stevens, and to the committee members for the time. So I'm uh, in, in interest of time. I'm, I've submitted some comments uh, at length, and I've submitted um, some proposed amendments that I um, put together after some discussions here in St. Albans City and with regional partners. Uh, and let me just really paraphrase really quickly uh, where we stand and what concerns us about S237. No, I think what concerns everyone even more is is that you know there is there is a fair and affordable housing crisis in the state. We've been talking about it for a long time at the state level and the regional level and the local level. And um, I think we all know that the way in which the state tries to address the housing crisis is going to play out in our local communities in some way, shape, or form. And 
basically it's going to be an issue of finances and it's also going to be an issue of permitting and the market in general. Um, I think that in terms of the goal of creating more affordable housing in the states, you're going to find a lot of people in agreement. But when it comes to what's been proposed as a, as a solution in S-237, specifically in section two, there's worry in our community that um, it's, it's, not the right, it's not the right way to find a solution that's going to work. We've uh, basically, we have uh, shared concerns amongst our planning commission, our city leadership, and our, um, our appointed representatives to our regional planning commission. And a lot of this comes out of the fact that we've been doing a lot uh, in the city of St. Albans to redevelop our community in general. And we, have, uh, we are already a pretty densely permitted community. And in fact, many of our existing multifamily um, housing density rules in the city of St. Albans among all of our residential districts pretty much match what we'd be forced to do for a minimum lot size as proposed in section two of S-237. But the issue is that um, there are a lot of considerations and provisions and standards that go into a community's local zoning statute. And it's all supposed to work together. Uh, everything from uh, lot width to uh, design review to lot size to what is permitted by right versus what is conditional use review. And then what are the considerations that you're supposed to take into account with conditional use review. And normally when a community engages in its local planning process and then its land use regulation process that comes from that municipal plan, all these things are drafted in lockstep and they all work together so that development in your community implements chapter 117 of title 24 and and your municipal plan and other community capacity and context concerns. Um, what section two of S-237 would do is across the board, sort of in a cookie cutter way, um, make huge changes to minimum lot size rules and uh, some considerations for what's in and what's out for conditional use review um, without any benefit of any real planning process as to whether or not this would really work, and whether it would work with all the other considerations um, in all the regulations in the many different communities in which this is this would play out. And I know, and it makes sense that it was chosen for areas with water and wastewater because those are the areas that could support the densities that are being called for, but. You've, you're capturing a lot of communities, a lot of different kinds of communities, and that all have slightly different rules that work for them. Um, for better or for worse, minimum lot sizes and conditional use review continue to be fundamental tools of how these communities um, you know, provide direction for local land use. And to change these things in this way without any um, idea of what other aspects of local land use it's going to affect, you know, we just, that's not the way in which you know it's actually going to achieve the goals of the bill. In the past, um, and even in 2004 with Act 115, which substantially rewrote Chapter 117, and with, you know, many people were worried about that back then too. Um, what Section 2 of S-237 proposes to do blows Act 115 out of the water in terms of what sort of effect, discrete effect it has on very important pieces of local land use regulation. And typically the way land use regulation works in the state is that the local communities get the ability to regulate the way we do from the state. We are creatures from the state. We are given a process we're supposed to follow in terms of how we come up with our planning and our regulation processes. And chapter 117 has some pretty comprehensive statewide goals for land use that we're supposed to carry out on the ground. But we are given the ability to find a way to meet those goals that also meets the context of all of our little communities. Um, 
And it's very rare in which chapter 117 says things like, there are a couple exceptions to the rule that really say, oh, and by the way, if you have this rule, it has to look exactly like this. One would be the accessory dwelling units where we are supposed to treat a property with an accessory dwelling unit the same way we would treat a single family home. It's very direct, very specific, and that's fine. Um, another is there's a rule that no community can um, prohibit multifamily housing outright within your community. You have to allow it somewhere. Uh, there are a couple other cases. Group, group homes of a certain size have to be permitted the same way a single family home is. Those are all good things that have done a lot for um, housing of various types in the state. But it, other than that, it was really more a matter of within, within a certain, high, within these two highway lanes, you've got to find a way to drive your community toward where we need, where the state needs you to be. And if, if when we engage in the zoning for great neighborhoods um, process with DHCD, and when we um, attended uh, the hearings on the road of the Senate Economic Development Committee about what to do about housing in the state, you know, I never thought that we'd see something like what's proposed in section two of 237 that has very specific state preemptions of local land use regulation and there was really no planning process. And I know there was no local planning process about whether or not these changes would actually work. What I thought we might see and um, what I've asked for in my amendments and, and what you'll see in some of the compromises put forward by Vermont Planners Association is we'd have some state goals um, that are informed by what we know, where we know we need to get, like uh, an order that communities need to increase their housing densities by a certain percentage over three years. Or communities need to implement um, an average net dwelling unit density over a period of three years. To, to say that my entire community needs to go to, a, to an eighth of an acre minimum lot size across the board uh, in any district that, has, that allows residential use, no matter what, um, it really breaks a lot of other aspects of our land use regulation. Um, and it ignores the fact that we have different residential districts of, districts of different types that have developed historically in different ways. Um, it ignores that we have some districts that allow uh, dwelling units at a 16th of an acre. Uh, and that if you were to average out the dwelling unit density in, in our city, we'd probably already meet this goal without needing um, this broad-based change to all of our regulations across the board. I think that, I think, I think that obviously we should have done something like this a long time ago. Uh, and we're all, you know, that, that's on all of us. There should have been some sort of really directed guiding legislation increasing housing density in the state Action like this is needed. Um, and I understand the need that how legislators feel that really bold action is needed because we got a bold problem here. And COVID-19 doesn't make it any easier. But I don't think this is the way to do it. And I do think, unfortunately, reacting to S-237 and trying to make sure that um, that this doesn't pass has actually delayed some of the uh, housing density um, improvements that we could have made in our city because now our planning commission has been talking for four months about S-237 instead of modernizing our residential districts or coming up with a dwelling unit bonus program for blighted homes. And that's all good because it's all part of the discussion. And as long as we end up with the right solution by the time we're done, then, you know, then no harm, no foul. But I would advocate, and I do in the amendments I propose, I advocate for at least another year of discussion about what's really gonna work for a legislative, uh, new legislation for housing density in the state with more discussion where, where all of the stakeholders know that what we were actually talking about is going to be a legislative mandate because no one knew that in the stakeholder processes that I was part of. And that could really guide a discussion toward what people think is gonna work. Um, if the members of this committee and the legislature feel that we gotta do something more, then I would, um, I would plead with you to consider two things in terms of the way section two of S-237 is written right now. And one is, instead of going to an across the board minimum lot size 
um, allow us to do an average net minimum lot size. So if I have a portion of my community that's 2,000 square feet of lot size per dwelling unit, and a portion of my community that's 4,000, an eighth of an acre, and a portion of my community that's um, maybe a little higher, when you average them all out, we are going to have an average net density of, of an eighth of an acre. And even barring that, I still think there needs to be some room in this bill for um, different local solutions that can be made, but still meet the goals of the bill, because you're going to find some little quirk where uh, section two just kind of breaks something and you end up with a community spending more time trying to plan new ways to counteract the new rules that S-237 is putting into place so that people feel like they're still going in the right direction. Um, we want everyone working in the same direction towards how are we just going to increase housing density in the most appropriate way. So I would look at the constraints report, the, the opt-out provision that's in S-237. I think that's too binary. It's either you're in or you're out. And I don't think it should be that way. I think um, if you're gonna keep a lot of section two in, you've gotta take that constraints report and make it more of a, an ability for a community to talk to DHCD about coming up with an alternate solution um, that still meets the intent of this new bill and then would still make that community of, um, eligible for all the uh, incentives that are linked to uh, implementing the inclusive development that are written into the bill. Um, if that could work, then you could say, look, even if, if there's something in, in section two that you can't do, or if you can find a better way to make it work in your community and still basically achieve, uh, you know, making sure that parking rules aren't over, overburdensome for housing, making sure that you still basically have whatever the new goal for minimum lot size is going to be in the state, then you can still have access to those incentives. Um, otherwise, I think it's really, it's not a, it's not a carrot approach. It's a stick approach because you're making incentives available to everyone unless they can't um, comply with section two. And you're going to hear from Karen Horn at VLCT. Uh, she has a list of some communities that could have some major issues and would have to file that, that constraints report. Because the other problem with the constraints report is that if I have a section of my community with water and sewer service and I really can't do the uh, eighth of an acre minimum lot size, that means my whole community's out. I have to file a constraints report, we're out. Uh, and we don't get access to the incentives that are linked to, the, uh, to implementing the inclusive development rules. Um, I think that's enough. I could certainly talk more. Happy to take any questions. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Sure. No, thank you for coming in, and 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 uh, thank you for well. First of all, for um, congratulations to St. Albans for all the work that they have been doing. That you guys have had quite an amazing um, run of construction and Renaissance um, downtown, and that's um, we're having a little different right now with the main road with uh, Main Street being torn up. But um, you guys have done a really great job up there. The I think um, we've got a couple of questions here um, and we will have you back um, because I mean, we were gonna have a lot of questions as we get into the nitty gritty of some of this, but let me um, let me start with Representative Walls and then Representative Kalecki. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I want to second, first of all, what the, I'll say uh, an hour again. So we spend quite a bit of time in Albans and place looking good. You're doing good work. Uh, unfortunately, my audio got a little funky when you were talking about lot size. And I, I thought I heard you saying something, proposing something about mixing. And I'm sorry, that's when my audio got really bad. So could you just, can you sum that up? Yeah, I think I, I would say that, you know, and this is where St. Albans City might start to diverge from other communities in terms of what we think is appropriate for to come out of Montpelier, but typically the state has given us guidelines and, um, and, and general targets to meet with our local land use regulation. And I think that if, if we were going to do something about minimum lot size with legislation, it should allow communities to reach a target averaged out across the different land use districts in your community. 
you might have a really dense district, a less uh, sort of a middle of the road district, and then one district that has historically not been as dense and the community is not quite ready to um, really uh, do something drastic there. And politically, it might not be possible. Uh, so allow us to average out the lot, the minimum lot sizes in our various residential districts to meet an average target. That's the idea. Okay, thank you. Representative Kalaki. Uh, sorry, excuse my cat here. is <laughs> wanted to come into the conversation as well. Um, uh, Mr. Sor, I, I'm, I'm wondering if in the bill, there's an opt out for communities. So would you would St. Albans be able to opt out of this in the way the bill is currently written? It doesn't work for the region. Um, you know, we would, it would mean that um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, I mean, Quite frankly, if we if if S two thirty seven passed as written, you know, there are some parts of it that would be really hard for our community. We would have to find a way to adjust the rest of our regulations to counteract some of the consequences. It and it might be possible to do. I, d I don't want to just give up. I I prefer to to take the challenge head on. What concerns me is that a community that has to opt out. Um, even, even if, if it's because aspects of section two aren't gonna work out in a small portion of your community, it means as it's written, you have to opt out your entire community. And then it means you're not eligible for some incentives that are available to all the other communities that were able to comply with the new law. And so then you're not on an even playing field with everyone else. Um, despite your best efforts. I don't, you know, there's an aspect of fairness that I don't think that meets. So that's my okay. concern with that. Thank you. Okay, Representative Gonzalez, then Zot. So uh, one of the things that um, historically, so you've talked multiple times about the historical development patterns and that historically development patterns um, around the US and in Vermont have very much uh, fallen along policy discriminatory lines for people of color, for people who uh, it's not just economics, but kind of in that reign as well. And so when I hear you say these, these words about uh, looking at historically what the development patterns are, that's something that really comes up for me and particularly around wanting to average out across your area or across the areas because this bill is not just specifically for St. Albans, but for the entire state. And so when we have, when you're talking about some areas might be denser, some areas might be less dense, let's follow historical patterns. That's something that um, really raises a red flag for me. Um, and so I uh, wanted to, don't specifically have a, a question in there. I, I thought that I might be able to get, get to that. Um, but I guess my question is, how, how have you all been talking about and thinking about that in terms of the, the equity issue that the historical development patterns really have been inequitable? And so then how, if you're advocating for uh, an not across the board a density, um, but instead continuing to have some parts be more dense and some parts to be less dense? Well, I would, I would say that, um, you know, it's probably a process in which a community would have to increase the densities across the board, um, the allowed densities. And I, you'll find that many communities over time have um, somehow ended up with zoning that allows for less density than what did historically develop over time. And, and I think there should be a lot more resources and, and discussion put into uh, allowing communities, giving us the resources to true up, to start, you know, the starting point should be, we do an analysis of how dense are we right now? Forget what our regulations tried to do when they were changed two decades ago. So that's our starting point. How, how, how dense are we now? None of that has gone into S-237 though. Uh, these rules came from, not from Vermont, but from Western states is, is what has what's been said or what I've heard in the past. You know, I would say a lot of it is contextual. In St. Albans, um, if you want it, you know, 
we're still a very dense community in terms of what our regulations allow. And, um, you know, I, I think that perhaps uh, in terms of the equity discussion, there's a lot more for us to learn and to listen, but that's not, that's also not something that's in here. I mean, if, if we're looking for um, zoning uh, or, or land use regulations to, that are more mindful of implicit bias and equity issues and social justice, um, I don't know that what's proposed in section two of S237 has benefited from that conversation at all. I think we should have the conversation. And I think it should, I think the conversation should be forced at local, in, in, in local communities. But I don't, this, I don't see that in this bill. Representative Zahn and then Trayano. Uh, Mr. Sawyer, um, when you were talking about this appeals process, was the, the entity was DHCD, this proposed appeals process in an opt-out situation, DHCD was the entity? Yeah, that, that makes the most sense to me. That's where I would go in terms of my knee jerk, in terms of you know how communities have typically interacted with the state on, on land use issues. The DHCD is one of our biggest resources for ideas and, and technical know-how. And also because I believe the uh, constraints report opt-out right now is supposed to go to DHCD. Uh, so that's why I, you know, that, that, that's why I thought of them. Okay, I, um, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't impugning the wrong uh, agency <laughs> accidentally, which is to say that this, this debate so far has very strong echoes of Act 46. I don't know if you're familiar with that with school consolidation, but essentially it's a, establishing a statewide mandate for action across all communities, a one size fits all. It supposedly had a built-in appeals process like the one you're proposing, but in practice, none of those appeals were actually approved based on their merits. They were only appealed um, based on already existing constraints. And so I'm worried that you're selling yourself short by wanting to have this appeals process. Again, not to impugn DHCD and say that they would be as disingenuous as other players in Act 46 were, but I would definitely caution you to not get the changes you want built into the bill as it stands rather than relaying, relying on the good faith of actors outside of the bill. That would be a dangerous uh, step in my opinion. Okay, right. so noted, thank you. Uh, Representative Traiano. I just had a comment on uh, parking. I know we had a, a short discussion the other day about it and Representative Tango seems to be up to speed on this, but. You know, I grew up on a street where there were five homes and big uh, and large trees uh, that uh, uh, existed on this street and uh, to a point now where um, you know, our family home is gone, but uh, um, an influx of multi uh, um, multi-family dwellings. When I grew up, there were all single family dwellings. So um, an, an influx of uh, a, a numerous uh, multi-family dwellings has presented a parking problem. When you build a four-family unit and you put one driveway in, uh, the rest of those uh, vehicles go on the street. And at some point, the street is um, unavailable for parking. So uh, in reality, um, I see landlords suffering from this as a, as a result of not being able to either rent or sell these properties when you can't leave your vehicle on the street overnight or you can't find a spot in front of your home. So, you know, I just rely on, on you know, my experience for that. And, um, you know, I think off street parking is very important in these developments and that, um, you know, that, 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 that it's not an encumbrance to landlords. Uh, it could be uh, in the long run, a benefit to landlords. Yeah, um, I, I didn't get to speak to that. I do think the parking provision, uh, which has, um, uh, Local, you know, local land use offices having to monitor leases based on whether or not parking spots are included in the lease and then uh, cutting our parking minimum parking uh, rules in half if, if a uh, property is within a certain distance of a transit stop. Although I don't know what a transit stop, I know what a transit stop is in Chittenden County. I can tell you it's not the same thing up in Franklin County. I understand that. Because my house becomes a transit stop if I call Green Mountain Transit. But um, I think that um, I think we need to be able to come up with our own solutions to that. Typically, households in our city, rental households, 
have more cars than what we hear is happening across the nation. Most of our streets become one lane streets if all of the on street parking is utilized. And that's okay, but it, it becomes a hassle that, and we do start getting complaints at City Hall. Um, I think we need to modernize our parking regulations because sometimes we find out projects we want to happen are saddled with more parking than they need. I get that, but we got to be able to have our own conversation uh, and to come up with a process by which um, I think on a case by case basis, a development's parking is based upon what's been released by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, but also um, uh, uh, similar developments in your community or around your community. So you, you, know, you know you're um, comparing apples to apples. Thank you. Chip, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to Karen Horn right now, just in the, the the, the manner of time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, like I said, we'll, we will have you back on this um, as we try to keep figuring um, figuring it out. But thank you for being um, speaking in mostly English about zoning issues. Um, we appreciate that, and uh, and we'll be in touch. But and please feel free to to stay and listen to the rest of the testimony. Um, Karen Horn from VLCT. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I would comment that you've already had a bit more of a substantive conversation regarding the details of the bill than was had in the Senate um, the two days before you adjourned on June 26. Because as you remember, there were a lot of balls in the air um, that, that week before, before you recessed, not adjourned. Um, so there, there are a couple of issues that um, Chip has mostly touched on that are of great concern to municipalities. And the first one that I'm going to discuss is actually a new issue that was not raised in the Senate, um, had not yet come to my attention. So um, section one would require towns to um, map water and wastewater lines, um, facilities and uh, service areas. And there's a few problems with this. Uh, the first being that um, many of the water lines and, and uh, wastewater lines in our more urban areas in the state are very old. In Rutland, some of them date before the Civil War and they're working on replacing them, but, but that is a fact. So. We don't actually know where all of those lines are. That's one problem. The second issue that has been raised recently is that generally you do not put out maps of water and wastewater lines for public consumption because of security and in fact terrorism concerns. That if somebody wants to have um, to majorly disrupt a community, they can affect your water supply. So the, the comment that I received um, from a number of actually public works directors on this is that um, if you wanted to generally have um, a, a map of the general service area, that could be, uh, that, that certainly would be something that would be workable. But if you want to map every single line and where it is, and the, all the interconnections and have that in a public forum that's um, fairly ill-considered. And then um, clearly producing those maps will be uh, very expensive for, for some communities that have not put all of that information to paper um, in the detail that's being required of the, of the uh, bill. So I would just ask you to think about those issues. Um, section two is of course the other section that I wanted to um, discuss with you. And we have the same concerns around a one size fits all uh, cookie cutter approach to requiring inclusive development. We do have unique communities in the state 
uh, they spent decades putting together plans and zoning regulations that enact division for that community. Um, and I did, I, I sent some testimony, which I believe is on your website about what some of the perverse effects might be in, in some of the municipalities that would be affected by the requirements. So in Bennington, you realize that um, due to the PFOA crisis that they had down there in the 2010 decade, um, they had to extend water lines to very rural parts of town where ordinarily they would not have ever extended those water lines. That was to provide people with clean water supply. But if you had to provide one quarter acre lots all the way along those lines into remote parts of town uh, outside of the downtown um, and, and uh, village centers, you would um, drastically and completely change the nature of that community. In Montpelier, uh, and, and Montpelier is really a, a model community in terms of infill development, um, rehabilitating old buildings upstairs in downtown into um, really nice apartments, well insulated with elevators and all those expensive amenities. Um, they've done that with the um, affordable housing uh, advocates around the state. They've also uh, changed their zoning to allow for older buildings outside of the, the downtown center and the core areas to be rehabbed and um, multi-units or, or duplexes allowed in communities. But, but it's a process that's been iterative that has uh, secured neighborhood buy-in that has been done with a sense of what the historic, apologies, Representative Gonzalez, but, but what the historic um, uh, pattern of development has been in, in that community and to impose the, those very small uh, lots citywide would again change um, the way Montpelier uh, was able to deal with housing uh, altogether. It also does raise, particularly in Montpelier's issue, uh, in Montpelier's situation, another issue with respect to wastewater, which is that Montpelier's wastewater um, facility is somewhat restricted due to court cases back in the um, early 2000s um, that, that prevented them from expanding capacity considerably. So a lot of these towns have pretty limited wastewater capacity. And if and and we're not sure that they could even accommodate the the build out if um, for instance one acre lots were required and um, somebody tried to build out every available lot there there wouldn't be capacity. In Randolph, which is also a, a very interesting situation, um, much of West Randolph and Ran Randolph Center are served by public water and wastewater. So up by the interstate and the I-89 exchange area, um, Fish Hill Road is the uh, just to the west of I-89, it's a residential district. And um, current minimum lot sizes there are five acres or two dwellings per 2.5 acres. Uh, the the require, requiring one eighth acres up there in what's really more rural area, um, again, would change the nature of that area. And um, you may be familiar with the fact that at that particular interstate interchange, there was a development proposed many years ago, not actually not that many years ago, that went all the way through Act 250, where they, um, they were denied the right to develop on the other, just on the other side of I-89 because of a number of other um, natural resources issues and, and a general um, disinclination to allow development around interchange areas. Uh, and then Stowe, um, 
we realize that Stowe doesn't always get a lot of sympathy um, because they are a resort community. But in, in Stowe, the sewer service district extends over eight miles from the lower village all the way up the mountain road and to the Trapp Family Lodge, the, uh, approximately 6,400 acres altogether. And um, right now it includes 13 different zoning districts with uh, lots ranging from one acre in size up to um, five acres. And if you were mandating one eighth acre lots in all of those 13 zoning districts, uh, the potential would be for more than 51,000 units of housing to be built. And um, that would not necessarily provide affordable housing, which is sort of, which is what the objective is. The, the um, sense in Stowe is that uh, you would get a lot more short-term rentals. You would get a lot of um, high-end second homes just because of the nature of that community. And you wouldn't necessarily get um, what we're, we're all trying to get to, which is providing housing for middle-income people, for um, lower-income people, for people who haven't had the opportunity to, to have um, purchased housing or owned housing or rental opportunities in some of these areas. So I, I, I did just want to um, emphasize that uh, we, we are hearing from all kinds of towns across the state now ab about S-237. Again, we didn't um, hear as much in the Senate because there was so many other Things being dressed in the Senate at the end of um, at the end of June there. So, uh, but this is something that uh, we really think needs to take a more iterative approach. That if if the bill could incorporate the recommendations of the zoning for great neighborhoods project and guidance that just came out, that that would be a much more um, effective way to to actually provide housing. So I'm happy to take questions. And maybe I spoke, talk too fast, I tend to do that. No, that's fine. We are, um, I, I'm gonna just ask a couple questions first because um, I, I'm a little bit confused by some of the scenarios that you're drawing here. Um, my impression of this legislation is, and as it deals with, uh, lot sizes and whatnot it has to do with districts, um, zoning districts that have already been created that allow for multi-unit housing. And I don't see where if you put a water line someplace that, um, you know, that you're going to have a second, an expensive second home on a one eighth acre lot in Stowe. So I'm just, in, you know, or, or in Bennington. I mean, I don't know the details of Bennington. If if that whole road that leads out to the you know places have uh, are already zoned for multi-unit, this is this. It strikes me that this legislation, so far, is that that I understand it, and I'm not done understanding it. It is about areas that have already allowed multi-unit housing, and that it's not about. Um, necessarily about allowing new units. It's not imposing one eighth acre or one quarter acre lots on um, areas that have not been zoned in that way. Is that, am I misinterpreting the, 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 this, this proposal? That's not the way we understand it. If you um, look on page five of the bill, um, Section A, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting creation of residential lots of at least one quarter acre with any, within any district allowing residential uses, any residential uses um, that are able to connect to a water system. And then um, one eighth acre within any district allowing residential uses that it's able to connect to a water and sewer system. So in Bennington, for instance, where they've extended the water line way out of town to um, 
to provide water supply to existing residents, those are residential areas already, and they would be required um, to, in, to put in place the one quarter acre of zoning all along that water line is, is the way we're understanding that. And does this have, um, doesn't this have a, an other element about um, transportation or is that just the parking element? Um, I, uh, I believe that's the parking element. The, the, if I could just say a couple things about the parking, it's, it's sort of fascinating right now, the parking. We, we didn't really have any particular um, issue with the uh, recommendation or the call to reduce parking for, um, for uh, units. Um, but that was all before COVID-19 and um, the really interesting twist right now is that nobody is overly interested in using public transportation. And my understanding is that sales of cars have um, gone through the roof in some places because people want to um, be safe, essentially. And um, so what do you do about parking? I don't have an opinion about that. I just think that the conversation has changed in the last several months. Um, if, you look at, if you look at also on page five, um, section C says, and I think this is what you were referring to, Mr. Chairman, um, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting, um, I've, I've read this backwards twice now, no bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting or requiring conditional use approval for a two unit dwelling on any lot within any regulatory district allowing um, residential districts, resident, effect, effectively, I think what it's saying is that if you have residential uses in an uh, area um, served by water and or wastewater, you need to allow for um, two units versus one unit, so duplexes. We don't have any um, objection to that. We also um, are fine with the language in here regarding the accessory dwelling units, which, which um, increases the potential for accessory dwelling units to be built. Um, and as I mentioned, we don't, uh, I, I think the parking question is sort of fascinating right now, but I don't really have a answer for you um, as to what might be best in, in that situation. Uh, the, the substantial constraints report is, um, would require a town to, to um, write the report. It gets posted on the Department of Housing and Community Development website. Any comments regarding that report also get posted on that website. And uh, as Chip mentioned, you would not be eligible for um, priority for any of the grants or, or um, that, that towns might be eligible for. So municipal planning grants, planning grants for water and sewer, interestingly, or um, a, ho a host of other um, kinds of funding sources. Okay, I have three questions um, and we do have one more witness left um, to hear from today. So Representative Hango, then Byrong, then Gonzalez. Thank you. Um, this is maybe more of a comment than a question for anybody. Um, I, I'm hearing a little bit about um, the municipalities being able to um, still retain local control, but then not be eligible, perhaps in the same way as any municipality that that followed these new regulations. But I was under the impression when reading this bill and getting the first walkthrough that anything that is passed in this bill will supersede any local control that any planning commission or municipality has enacted in their community. So I did wanna make sure that I'm hearing that correctly, that this is essentially removing control of neighborhoods and character of an area from the local planning commissions and folks who live in those communities. Um, 
And the other thing that concerns me is that nobody is really seeming to pay a whole lot of attention to this zoning for greater neighborhoods report. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of work went into that, a lot of thought went into putting that out, and we really should take note of that, um, the points that are in that before we pass legislation like this. So they're, they're really comments, but if somebody wants to correct me on the local control issue, I would have to stand corrected. Thank you. I, I, I'd say you're correct, um, Representative Hango, that the way this bill is written, it is a preemption of local authority under zoning. Which happens to a degree in some of the other state-run programs, the designated downtowns and, um, and whatnot. So, um, no, good well, points. Good, good points. Let's um, move to Representative Byrong. Uh, did Karen? Did you have further, further comment? No, no, no. I, I know time's short. I'll, I'll hush. Good. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Karen. So my question's a uh, two-part question-ish, revolving around the mapping component. So um, Virgin's the community I uh, represent, surrounding area. Uh, we have one of the very old, very antiquated. Uh, stormwater systems, um, and ironically, to this conversation just this morning, our, our public works was um, putting smoke through all of our lines because we're in that lead up to trying to repair and augment this infrastructure. And, and yes, it's very expensive. We're looking at a, a total project cost of somewhere. Oh man, I think it's between fifteen and twenty million dollars is what we're looking at right now. Um, so. With that though, I mean, we're essentially are trying to map it because we don't know where everything lies as it is. And we kind of need to know where like the, the areas that are uh, more compromised than others are located and how to fix it. Hence pushing the smoke through the whole town. It, by the way, the tenant in my duplex loved it when their uh, basement filled with smoke this morning. That was a fun phone call. Um, so, so I guess like around the mapping concerns, I mean, we're kind of doing it anyway with the, uh, communities that are being proactive with their current antiquated infrastructure. So how do you see that sort of playing out? I mean, they, in order to do these projects correctly, they kind of have to create a map to improve the system. So, um, I, I think the more important issue is what you publish, um, and, the recommendation from the public works people we've talked to is that um, you not publish the specifics of where all those water lines and, and wastewater lines go, mm -hmm. that you might, um, that you would put out um, what the general service area is. And if somebody is actually doing a development project, they would go into the um, engineer's office, public works office anyway, and get the specifics of what connections would um, mean, you know, what would be entailed in making connections. Uh, in the other bill, H926, which is the, they, when they were in the Senate initially in June, those two bills were together, um, but, uh, in the other bill, there is language around um, connections to municipal wastewater systems and water supply systems and who permits that. So you're going to have that conversation. Okay. No, no. I mean, what you just said is, it, it, I'm so new to this content right now. Um, I've been going back and forth with some folks with like our local planning people, regional planning, and, and actually my wife is on our municipal planning commission so she actually walked me through a lot of the language in this so that i mean that makes a lot of sense to me you know having that be secure information because of those concerns but you know and obviously being made available to the parties that need it for the work so okay thank you okay. representative gonzalez that was part of my question as well karen and um and so um wonder and also hearing about your concern, even though right now in terms of um, answering Representative Byron's question, you said that your concern is more about the security of the information rather than the cost of the mapping. Um, but when uh, my, my question is about that I understand as the bill is written, it doesn't say you know immediately, there's not that date of mapping at all. And so there's not that um, necessarily a big upfront cost um, like 
uh, Representative Byron's town is, is going through on their own right now. Um, so I just wanted to ask your thoughts and clarification about that in terms of the cost, but actually uh, you might have something to add, but I think you just answered it, answering Representative Byron's question. Well, that is a good point that there's not a um, date certain by which you have to have accomplished that. But um, to, to Representative Byron's point about the cost, it, it's not an inexpensive proposition to, to put those maps together and to actually determine where all those um, lines are and where the leaks are. Theor theoretically, the smoke wouldn't come up in anybody's basement. Yeah, and, and so I was just wanting to, to get your opinion on um, how it's currently written in terms of that time um, that's required and so that upfront cost, because when I read the bill, I see it as potentially if someone is interested in putting an auxiliary dwelling unit on um, or they're, they're interested in uh, re um, splitting up a five acre lot, for instance, like you um, were talking about in those places that they could ask the city to have that, to look at that information and the city could be in that process or so it could be iterative as we've used in kind of different ways of building out and so that it wouldn't be this huge one-time cost for the city to map um, everything all at once um, is the way that I'm reading the bell. So I just, that's why I wanted oh, to take that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, generally what happens is when there's a new um, requirement put into the planning statutes, chapter 117 and title 24, the next time that you update your municipal plan, you have to incur incorporate those provisions. So a plan, a municipal plan is in effect for eight years now. And um, the next time that you update your plan, which might be eight years out or might be, you know, two years out, you would include those um, provisions. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing I wanted to mention about the um, accessory dwelling units is that um, that's not tied to water and sewer. That's anywhere in the municipality. And a lot of those um, residential units for better or worse are on septic, not on a municipal sewer system. So, so that's just another, um, you know, you would have to figure out is the septic sufficient to support that accessory dwelling unit, which is a whole different question Thank that you. you have to deal with now, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, actually a question I want to deal with after at our next session on this, because you know there were comments about um, adding in all these different one eighth acre lots, and you know what if the the municipal capacity like Montpelier you know can't handle it. And my feeling, at least what we what I know of locally, is that if you don't if you can't handle it, then you can't permit it. You can't demand someone, a developer can't demand that there be allowed to build, even if they get all the other zoning, if the capacity doesn't exist in the wastewater treatment center uh, system, then um, then it can't be done until that investment's been made. But we can, I think that's, that's let's take that next week. Um, Cause I wanna get to Peter Tucker before we, before we have to head off to the floor. Um, um, thank you, Peter, for waiting. Um, if you could just identify yourself and um, your affiliation and then let us know what you're thinking about S237, that would be fabulous. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, so Peter Tucker uh, here for the Vermont Association of Realtors. I'm the chair of our Government Affairs Committee. Um, and, you know, when S237 was introduced in the, in the Senate, um, you know, we always look at housing bills as being kind of our ballywick. You know, this is this is what we do. Um, we work with homeowners every day uh, and property owners. And you know, as I was listening to testimony, I was I was thinking a little bit. You know, we have a, a maybe a different perspective um, in that. You know, when you look at inclusionary zoning or or the the way this particular bill is written, um, it allows owners of properties maybe a little bit greater flexibility in, in you know, what they can do with their properties. So um, from that perspective, um, you know, I, we think this is, you know, it, it's probably good for most property owners. Um, you know, at the same time, our committee members have, have discussed um, with, with different zoning administrators, you know, kind of the, the limitations of this. Um, so, you know, we would encourage the committee or you know whatever committee of jurisdiction ends up with it, 
um, to, you know, to look at, at inclusionary zoning and to try and accommodate uh, the, 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 of the towns um, in a way that allows the, the towns to have, um, you know, reasonable control. Um, at the same time, you know, we really do feel that, um, you know, that, that there are opportunities here. Um, and I, and I, when I was listening to the testimony, one of the things that, that kind of occurred to me, you know, when we were talking about, you know, if it's served by water and wastewater, that it needs to, you know, that it should fall into this category. My impression was that this was going to be in downtown development areas, village centers, and uh, neighborhood designated areas, you know, as they, they become defined probably in, in H926. Um, so, you know, maybe that's a way to, to, you know, keep it from extending all the way up Mountain Road, for instance, um, you know, that there are, it would only be available in those certain areas. Um, we actually were a participant in the Zoning for Great Neighborhoods report. Uh, we got a, a grant from the National Association of Realtors that to help with that report and are, are very supportive of, you know, the results of that report as well. Um, but, you know, we really come at this with a, a sense of home ownership. Um, you know, certainly we understand that affordable housing for rent is, is an important uh, and missing ingredient in the state of Vermont. Um, but opportunities that, that create housing uh, that people can purchase um, is, is a primary interest for realtors uh, kind of naturally. Um, so anything that, that helps to accomplish that, um, you know, we, we would like to see happen. Um, as the other comment that I had, and I, you know, I will be brief, um, you know, regarding the short-term rental study, I mean, I think if there's a study out there that's, that's already been created, um, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, I do believe that allowing local municipalities to manage, you know, the, the, the way that their, their municipality handles short-term rentals, um, is the correct approach, um, for, for that, um. And, you know, other than that, really, I just wanted to let this committee know, I know that, that you haven't heard from the realtors in quite some time, um, but that, that we anticipate being active, you know, on housing issues and especially, you know, ownership of homes, because we feel that it's, it's a real uh, key element uh, to, you know, for families to build wealth and families to have stability. And, um, you know, it also adds to the tax base as well. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I have, I can make comments on the condition of the real estate market or any other questions that the committee may have. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, Peter. And I'll, we'll hear about that, I think, from you later. I, I, we can all imagine that the market's been pretty hot, but I don't want to rely on hearsay. So we'll hear mm -hmm. from you later mm -hmm. on that. I, I think what is, what interests me, um, um, Peter, in this conversation, and Chip, is that Chip, you made a comment early on about, well, you know, if, if we have to achieve a certain density over three years, and, you know, that's that we has to be with developers or builders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, Peter's comment about where this might give developers or owners more flexibility, how do those play in together? What did you mean by it, it might give people more flexibility? Well, if there, there are you know, if, if, a, if there are lower minimum standards, then, you know, a property owner would then be able to do, have other options for their property that they might not have under current uh, zoning conditions. Two questions on deck here, Representative Hango and then Gonzalez. Rather than a question, this is another comment, and if you'll indulge me on this, and I know you said, um, Mr. Chair, that we're going to talk about this next week, but I really want to put this on people's radar that um, septic systems, it's a big problem, as well as um, wastewater, municipal wastewater systems in the state of Vermont. We've had a number of occurrences over the last few years of sewage being released into our waterways. Um, because of big storms or what have you. Um, we also have some pretty strict rules um, that residences currently need to follow in terms of building septic systems. So all of this is leading me to water quality, to our lakes, um, our rivers, and um, just basically being mindful of groundwater and the need 
if we do build up this development that we are going to have to dispose of its waste. Um, I have some knowledge of septic and wastewater issues and um, this is a real concern to me, particularly living in rural Vermont, but as we know, St. Albans and um, Burlington and other municipalities have had some issues as well with this. So please be mindful of our environment when we talk about this as well. Thank you. I have a feeling the second half of the bill, the 926 addresses quite a bit of that as well. Um, but we don't know that yet. Um, we haven't seen that bill. Um, Representative Gonzalez. Uh, Peter, I'm wondering if from the real estate agent's perspective, uh, you, you could talk a little bit about more about the auxiliary housing units and you um, talked about uh, encouraging home ownership and um, if you know about the, the ways that auxiliary housing, the ADU, ADUs um, <laughs> uh, support home ownership. Well, I mean, an auxiliary housing unit would, would typically be a rental property, right? I mean, I, that's my impression at any rate. Um, you know, what we would be encouraging of is, is properties that can be developed, you know, either smaller lot size that allow for that uh, independent, um, you know, independent property to be, to be built and then conveyed to somebody who, you know, has greater, you know, greater financial interest in the property. Um, contributing to the tax base, I think that's another, you know, regardless of, of how it's done, if it adds to the grand list or, or the value of the property, um, that's a positive thing from, a, you know, from a, a tax uh, perspective. Um, but it, it really, you know, it would be properties that, that then can be conveyed uh, to other parties. So I'm not sure auxiliary dwelling units would always, you know, would accomplish that necessarily. Um, you know, it would be more in the in the smaller, you know, allowing for a smaller lot size to be developed and then conveyed. So when you, your perspective from a real estate agent is more from uh, the perspective of having smaller lot sizes that are um, more financially accessible to folks. Right, right. You know, I, I think that that's, you know, that's really, and, you know, we talk about affordable housing, uh, you know, for me, it's entry level housing, you know, something that could be achieved, um, you know, maybe as their the first step in the home ownership. Right, thank you. Thank you. And Peter, I'll put you on the spot um, in our final six minutes, just to help me understand if it's possible in less than six minutes, um, what drives the market? Um, is it the price of the land? Is it the view? Is it the sticks that are needed to build it? I mean, I mean, I guess, it, and I guess I'll start my answer by saying it depends on the community. True. Um, and I, I, if I can just rephrase the question, possibly, you know, that, that, you know, what it, you know, what are the underlying costs of, of, you know, developing a property like this? Um, and it is, you know, the sticks cost a certain amount of money to build, you know, the, the employees to, to construct that home, you know, that's a, that's a fairly constant uh, value, if you will. Um, you know, the underlying cost of the land, and the cost of permitting um, are the two things that, that seem to create a much higher base level, you know, that when you add the stuff that you can't really change a lot, you can't change, you know, the roof structure, the, the you know, the materials used um, that, that push, uh, push affordability so much. So, you know, things like this that maybe allow for, um, you know, little less, you know, less infrastructure or, or um, development costs uh, on the front side, potentially bring down that overall cost of, of that housing unit. Okay, everybody got that? There'll be a quiz on Tuesday. Um, there, I'm gonna um, thank everybody who came. Jacob, thank you for, for sitting in and listening and being available. Ellen, thank you. Uh, Chip, thank you. And, and Karen, thank you for this. I, I um, it is, um, uh, odd to always hear that there's, you know, in the short time that we've had that there's, there's um, 
this amount of testimony or this kind of detail is is kind of a, a new opportunity for you guys to express. So I'm glad we we're able to do that. We will continue working on this. This remains a priority to get it right. Um, and I think I'll leave us on a light note, just as a, a personal disclosure, um, full disclosure. Um, Peter Tucker um, is my wife's sister's husband's sister's husband. The reverse engineer is my statement, Tom. Yes. So uh, we, we leave it at brother-in-law, but I suppose in that Vermont kind of way, um, uh, Peter and I have washed dishes at Christmas time together um, in different places. So um, Indeed. just didn't want to get that into the news in the, ne in the most negative, in, in the most mm -hmm. negative way. So um, thank you everybody. We have to get to the floor and um, we will see you at 8.30 tomorrow morning. Um, to hear about the uh, housing programs that we've stood up. Thank you, everybody.